Welcome to the first presentation in the third webinar series presented by the International Absorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing absorption as a solution to scientific, engineering, and human welfare challenges through the promotion of absorption research and education. We hope that all of our attendees, the families, and their colleagues are safe amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We thank everyone for attending the webinar today. The webinar series has been an immense success. The recordings of previous webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube. This is the first webinar of our third series, which we will continue to have monthly into next year. We intend to continue with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other research institutes, as well as PhD students and early career researchers. Announcements regarding the third um, webinar series will be distributed through the IAS mailing lists and the IAS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be given by Professor Corey Simon of Oregon State University. I am Nicholas Wilkins of the University of Alberta in Canada. Today's webinar will be moderated by Juliana Coelho of Universidade Federal do Sierra in Brazil and Nicholas Carenti of Rutgers University in the United States. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other moderators are not necessarily those of the IAS or other institutions associated with those individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our dues are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal, Absorption, contribute to travel grants and workshop seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of absorption. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials, including our journal, as well as the absorption database published by Springer Materials. The membership renewal for 2022 began on October 1st and any payments after this date will apply to 2022. Anyone can follow the IAS on Twitter at intadsoats for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please help expand our YouTube channel by subscribing. The IAS will host the 14th International Conference on the Fundamentals of Absorption in May 2022 in Broomfield, Colorado, near Denver. The conference will cover all aspects of absorption, ranging from the fundamentals, process applications, green energy, among others. Beyond the scientific content, the setting is outstanding, just downhill from the mountains of Western Colorado, which will allow for excellent side trips and excursions. Abstract submission is now closed. Registration information is available online and an official opening for registrations will be announced in the first months of 2022. The Education Committee is happy to announce the second IS Twitter poster conference that will be held between November 29th and December 3rd, 2021. This is a no cost event to promote the research of graduate students and early career researchers. Registration is required to be considered for one of the four 100 USD best poster prizes. Register and post your poster before the 29th with the hashtag IAS, IAS Twitter poster two. More details and the registration link are available on the website. And now I'll hand it over to Nicholas Carenti who will moderate the Zoom Q and A and introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Nicholas. Corey Simon is an assistant professor in the School of Chemical, Biological, and Environmental Engineering at Oregon State University. He earned his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley in 2016, after which he had a postdoctoral position at the Altius Institute for Biomedical Sciences. He also published the PI IAST package with Baron Smith and Maciej Horanchik. His research group leverages machine learning, statistical mechanics, mathematical modeling, and molecular simulations to accelerate the discovery and deployment of nanoporous materials for gas storage, separations, and sensing. 
During today's webinar, questions can be submitted to the speaker via the Q&A tab of Zoom or as comments on the YouTube live stream. Juliana will forward those comments to Zoom for Professor Simon to answer. Professor Simon, we will now turn the uh, video feed over to you and you can start. Okay, you can hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Yeah, so thank you, Nick, for the kind introduction. And I'm really grateful to Dan for inviting me to give this webinar. And I'm really excited to tell you about our research. It's a bit ambitious, but I will try to tell you about two separate papers. So this is the first presentation, and then we'll have a break with questions. And then I will give a second presentation on a different research paper. But I plan for them both to be less than half an hour. So yeah. So the first paper, a recommendation system to match nanoporous materials with gas absorption tasks. First, I'll acknowledge our machine learning team. Uh, this paper, uh, this talk pertains to a paper published in Chemistry of Materials, and it's a collaboration with Dan Sidarius at NIST and Xiaoli Fern, who is a professor of computer science here at Oregon State University with me. And I especially like to acknowledge uh, Arnie Sturluson, he was my first PhD student, uh, who is the first author on this paper. And this is funded by the NSF. So covalent organic frameworks or, or COFs are tunable nanoporous materials that absorb gas. So here's what one looks like in practice, the powder. This cough, cough LZU1, exhibits an internal surface area of 410 meters squared for every gram. Here's this crystal structure. You can see the nano size pore. Um, and then you can also see the walls of the channels that form the surface to which this figure alludes to. Uh, this cough was made from these two molecular building blocks, which were stitched together to form an extended network with covalent bonds. And by changing the chemistry of the building blocks of the cough, you can arrive at many different coughs. So they're really tunable. Um, and as you know, gases absorb to surfaces, so coughs are very useful for densifying and thus storing gases, for separating gases by exploiting their selective absorption properties, and for sensing gases by exploiting both their sensitive and selective absorption properties. Okay, so here's the problem that we considered in our paper. We have many candidate costs, many candidate materials. Here's a list of them. And there are many absorption tasks that we're interested in finding a material for. For example, we want a material to store methane to capture H2S or CO2. So these are the absorption properties we're interested in. And if we had the so-called material property matrix, where, for example, this entry gives the amount absorbed of carbon dioxide in this material. So the color depicts the value of the absorption property. If we had this, then matching the optimal material for each task would be a trivial lookup problem. You simply find which absorption task you want, look down the column and find the maximum value, and then voila, that's the best material for that application. So if we had this uh, complete matrix, uh, that would be wonderful. However, in practice, this material property matrix is very incomplete. There are many missing measurements. So for every material, there are a lot of gas absorption properties we don't know. And for every gas absorption property we're interested in for some application, not every material, for example, has been, uh, the methane absorption isotherm in every material has not been measured, right? So there are a lot of missing values or question marks. Uh, so this is the incomplete material property matrix that in reality we encounter. And our goal is to leverage the observed entries in the material property matrix that we do know to, in a data-driven strategy, impute the missing values or complete the matrix. So we want to make predictions for the question marks. And we don't want to go into the lab and measure all of these properties to complete the matrix because that's very expensive and time-consuming. So yeah, we want to train a machine learning model it's going to be a data-driven model 
we're going to leverage the observed entries we do have to um, predict the values in the missing entries in the question marks. That's the high level overview of our task. So here's the machine learning approach. Well, we want to model the value of the adsorption property P in material M, which is entry MP of the material property matrix. So what functional form should we use to model that? Well, our hypothesis is that there's some low dimensional latent space in which materials can be represented as vectors. So for example, this material, uh, material M, here's its latent vector. And similarly, properties that we're interested in can also be represented as low dimensional vectors in the same latent space. And then we model the value of the absorption property P material M is the inner product or dot product between these two latent vector representations. What that means geometrically is if these two vectors point in the same direction, then that material has an affinity for that property. If they point in the opposite direction, that material has a disaffinity for that property. And we also add a material bias mu M. And this reflects the fact that, well, some materials just have really high surface areas and tend to exhibit high values of all of the properties. Um, and, and I want to mention that this is really analogous to movie recommendation systems. So the analogy here is that the materials are like movies and the gases are like users, right? And at Netflix, they have the same problem. There are many missing values. And in the entries, there are the ratings that we do know. And at Netflix, the goal is to predict the missing ratings so that we can recommend movies for users. So here we're trying to recommend materials for gas absorption tasks instead. And so with that analogy, um, I want to give a more intuitive explanation of this. So this material bias would be something like for Shawshank Redemption, that would be very high for that movie because everyone likes Shawshank Redemption. Uh, so similarly, this reflects just the tendency of a material to exhibit high values of properties, independent of interactions with the property. So once we know these latent vector representations and material biases, um, the complete matrix follows from simply doing this matrix multiplication. Um, and I title this a low rank model of the matrix A because it's really making a low rank approximation of the material property matrix A. So this matrix here has the latent representations of the materials in its rows. So this is the latent representation of material M. And then this property vector matrix uh, it contains the property vectors in its columns. And then I list the material biases for material M in the rows here, it's just repeated. Uh, so this is representing this equation in matrix form. And you can see that the dimensionality of this latent space that we impose, which is K, imposes a constraint on the rank of this matrix A. So that's why it's called a low rank matrix model. Um, and so this equation here, I'm really depicting just the rules of matrix multiplication uh, and, and that, that gives this equation. Okay, so what we want to do is leverage the observations that we do have. So the entries of this matrix that we have to learn these latent vector representations and material biases. Once we do that, the complete matrix follows from doing this matrix multiplication and we have predictions for the missing entries, voila. We also get for free a map of materials. So by looking at the scatter of these latent material representations in the latent space, we will see that materials with similar properties tend to congregate in the latent space, whereas materials with dissimilar properties tend to separate. And this is very useful for simply organizing materials according to their absorption properties in a data-driven way using incomplete data. Okay, so now the question is, how do we leverage the observations that we do have to learn these latent vector representations? Well, we will pose a loss function that describes the 
um, error in the difference between the observations that we have that we know and our prediction for those observations. So this is sum of square errors. And the sum, of course, is only over the observed entries. So that's important. We only have these observations. So we basically fit to the observations that we do have. So you can imagine a little knob and you're tuning the parameters of the latent vector representations and the material biases until you minimize uh, this sum of square errors. So the difference between what your model predicts for the known entries and what the actual entries are. But we also have a regularization term and this promotes model parsimony to prevent overfitting. You can think of it as a force that pushes the latent vectors towards the origin because it penalizes very big in magnitude latent vectors. So this is to prevent overfitting and improve generalization error. Okay, so yeah, the goal is to minimize the loss. So tune the latent vector representations until you minimize the loss. And that's how you can learn these from the observations that you do have. And there are two hyperparameters in such a low rank matrix model of the material property matrix. One is what is the dimension of the latent space in which the materials and properties lie? That's K. Two is what is the value of the regularization parameter that you should use here? And that will trade off model parsimony and how well you fit your training observations. Uh, so, so that's the major idea behind a recommendation system. Now I'm going to show you a demonstration of a material recommendation system. And for our material property matrix, we will leverage a data set of simulated data. This data set pertains to 560 costs that have been experimentally synthesized and 16 gas absorption properties. They're simulated absorption properties at various conditions relevant to applications of costs. So I've listed these common gases that are involved in the columns of the matrix. So this just shows a scattered plot of all the properties. Uh, and you can see, for example, here's hydrogen and oxygen, and these are really well correlated, uh, which gives us hope that we can fill in the missing entries accurately. So this is our data set that we'll work with. And in reality, it's incomplete or it's complete, but we introduced missing values into this matrix at random so that we can make an incomplete material property matrix. Here's one example here where 60% um, of the values are missing. Okay, so it's a very tall and um, thin matrix. So there's 560 coughs down the rows and 16 gas absorption properties in the columns. So we z-score standardize the absorption properties. So that's what the color bar denotes. So here's zero, white would be it has an average absorption property. Green means it has higher than average and pink means it has lower than average. So it's a way to visualize this matrix and the gray entries here are the missing values. So basically the goal is to leverage the colored entries in this matrix to make predictions for the gray entries, right? And because in reality, this material property matrix is complete, we're just introducing missing values in it. That's advantageous for a study like this, a prototype study, because we can investigate the effect of sparsity on the performance for the imputation. And we can also use these gray values that were left out of the matrix as test data, because we, in reality, know the values of those gray entries. Okay, so given this incomplete material property matrix that we've generated from simulated gas absorption data and costs, our goal is to learn a low rank matrix model and assess one, its imputation accuracy, two, how well it can cluster materials into a map wherein materials with similar properties congregate, and three, study the influence of sparsity on the imputation accuracy. That's what we're going to do. So first, what is the imputation performance? We train a low rank model on the observations, so on the colored entries here, and we see how well it predicts the missing entries, which are in gray, which we in reality know. What this plot is showing is the imputation performance. Um, so once we learn the latent vectors, we do this matrix multiplication, voila, we have predictions for the missing entries. And this is showing the Spearman rank correlation coefficient on the test data, and it's grouped by property. So for example, hydrogen at 298K and five bar, 
um, the Spearman rank correlation coefficient is very high. And this shows that the recommendation system is able to rank materials according to their absorption properties very well. And the exception here is the wider Henry coefficients. Um, the Spearman rank correlation coefficient is quite low. So the recommendation system is not very good at ranking materials according to water absorption. Um, and similar not, not, similarly, not too well for low pressure CO2 absorption. So it depends on the property. Um, so, so yeah, I think this shows that the imputation performance is satisfactory. Uh, this is for 60% of the values are missing. And then I also put the stars here. Uh, and this corresponds to sort of a benchmark model where we only model the entry AMP as a material bias. So this basically ignores any interactions between the properties and materials. And it basically says the material is good or not, irrespective of the property that you're interested in. So you're not using this interaction term M transpose P. You're not learning any latent vector representations. And if you train this material bias only model, you can see that the performance is quite diminished from when you include the interactions. So that shows that it is important to learn these latent vector representations and the recommendation system is learning meaningful interactions between the materials and properties. This also gives us hope that the latent rep representations of materials uh, will contain useful information about the materials when we make the map. It's also interesting to look at the material biases. So here I'm plotting the material bias mu m for each material. So if it's positive, that means the material tends to exhibit a high value of the properties. If it's negative, that means that the material tends to exhibit lower than average values of properties. And I'm showing the structures of the materials that have the lowest material biases and the highest ones. So this material here, um, this is like the Shawshank redemption of coughs, right? It's just a cough that happens to exhibit, that tends to exhibit really high values of all of the absorption properties, maybe because of its high surface area. So given a new gas absorption task, maybe we should try this cough for it, right? Okay, so this is my favorite part. Um, and this is the map of coughs that I was alluding to. So we have these learned latent vector representations of the materials from the incomplete data by training the low rank model, right? These lie in a nine dimensional space because that was the optimal rank of the matrix. That was the optimal size of the latent space that we found. However, we use principal component analysis to project these nine dimensional latent vectors of materials into a 2D space. And that's what you're seeing here. So each point here represents a different cough in material space. So the plane is a 2D representation of the material space. And I repeated it three times because I'm coloring the coughs by three different properties. So here, the, the coughs are colored by methane absorption. Here, the H2S Henry coefficient, and here, the H2O Henry coefficient. So pink means it tends to exhibit a lower than average value. Green means it tends to exhibit a high value of that property. And interestingly, the coughs with the high methane absorption congregate in this region of the latent material space, coughs with high H2S absorption here, and with high H2O absorption here. So they're in different locations of material space. So what this is showing is that this map of materials is able to group together coughs according to their absorption properties, which I think is neat. Um, and remember that uh, we're modeling the value of absorption property P and material M is the inner product between these latent vector representations. And we all know from our calculus class, the inner product involves the cosine of the vector be, of the angle between those vectors, right? And so if you look at where these latent property vector representations lie in the latent space, they correspond with the materials that have those high properties. So here's the latent representations of these three properties that I've shown up here. So here's the latent representation of methane. And look, that's exactly where the high performers lie, right? And here's H2S, and, and here's the high performance for H2S. Uh, H2O is over here, and here's the high performance H2O. So you can directly compare the latent representations of the materials and the properties. So yeah, uh, the recommendation system is sort of a weird combination between supervised learning because you're making predictions about the missing entries, 
but it's also kind of like unsupervised learning because you're learning a latent representation of the materials. Okay, the last thing is how does sparsity affect the imputation performance? This is very important. Um, so each of these plots shows the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. So how well the recommendation system can rank materials according to each adsorption property. So here's for oxygen, for example, as a function of theta, which is the fraction of the entries that are observed. So as we observe more of the entries, as the matrix becomes more complete, the recommendation system can predict the missing values much more accurately, which is intuitive. So that's what that's why it's increasing here. But if 70% or more of the matrix is, has missing entries, then you can see this precipitous drop off in the performance. So see how it drops off really quickly. Um, and this is probably a conclusion that only pertains to this data set. Uh, but it's still useful to know that um, you will see a performance drop off um, if your matrix is too sparse, which is intuitive. You don't have enough data to learn meaningful latent vector representations. And finally, this explains, um, so we originally set out to build a recommendation system using the NIST ARPA-E database of novel and emerging adsorbent materials. And the material property matrix that we built from that database was only 20% complete. Uh, so it was very sparse. And we found the recommendation system was not able to learn meaningful latent vector representations for this, for this real experimental data. So one hypothesis based on this finding is that it's just too sparse. Uh, but it could also be, for example, noise in experimental measurements too, because simulations don't have as much noise. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's it. Um, so the conclusions are, there's many materials with many properties that we're interested in. Observations and practice are incomplete. There's missing data. And by training a low rank model of a material property matrix using the observed entries, we can one, impute the missing data, impute the missing entries. Two, draw a map of materials wherein materials with similar properties congregate. Um, and so finally, I'll mention some drawbacks. So the most absurd, part of this project, um, if this were a contest to most accurately predict the entries of the matrix, uh, you would not want to use this. You would want to also include structural features, right? So we are ignoring all structural features here, right? Um, we're not inputting the pore size, the surface area, the fraction, hydrogen, what building block it is. There's no input about the structural features of materials. So we could do much better if we input structural features. And we're working on that. So how do you incorporate structural features into a low rank matrix model? And relatedly, it's a cold start problem. This happens in movie recommendations too. Let's say you have a new material that comes along and you don't know any of its properties. Well, without knowing any of its properties, there's no way to know what its latent vector representation is. There's no way to learn that. And so that's a cold start problem because you can't possibly make a prediction for a new material when it comes along and you don't have any measurements. Similarly, this happens in movie recommendation systems if a new user joins and they haven't rated anything, Netflix knows nothing about them. And including structural features would actually solve this problem because then you can use the structural features of the new material to make predictions of its properties. Okay, yep, thanks for listening. Um, check out our paper for more details and I'll, I'll take any questions at, at, at this moment. Thank you, Professor Simon. Um, we are uh, gonna just take a minute and let any questions filter in from the YouTube uh, live stream. Um, but a uh, question that I have, um, you discussed that you're using these adsorption properties. Can you just discuss briefly what exactly the properties are that you're looking at? Oh, sure. So here's a list of them, an explicit list of them here. So these okay. are simulated uptakes of many different gases at different conditions. So for example, this is oxygen at room temperature and five bar. And to make predictions on these cost structures, uh, the authors, conducted molecular simulations, particularly grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations of oxygen absorbing in the cough to make the 
prediction of this value. And then for the Henry coefficients, it's a bit different of a molecular simulation uh, through Widom insertions, just a vanilla Monte Carlo integration. And they use classical force fields to model interaction between the gases and the cough and between the gases inside the cough. Great. And um, actually, this slide is perfect because um, the other question that I had was um, you show, for example, at CO2 adsorption at low pressures that you have a, a fairly low correlation coefficient compared to the others. Um, how does this affect the reliability of the model in predicting adsorption um, or usability of, uh, of this model for adsorption properties, for example, this specific system, CO2 at low pressures? Yeah, so our first thought in assessing the imputation performance is to group all the properties together and have a parity plot of the predicted property versus the actual property, right? And we have that plot in our paper and it's valid to look at, but here we've grouped the performance by adsorption property because some property is just innately more difficult to predict than others. Um, and that's what this plot is showing. So I think this plot is really valuable because it tells you how much you should trust predictions for different adsorption properties. So I agree with you that if you're looking for a carbon dioxide absorbing material at low pressure, then the recommendation system is not going to rank materials as reliably as, for example, high pressure methane absorption. Right. Great. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so this tells you sort of confidence you should have in imputation. Perfect, thank you. Um, we do have a question um, from uh, Paul Ayakomi. Uh, he says, could you attempt to rationalize why for some properties, the simple bias matrix is fairly good at prediction while for some others, it is very poor. Sure. Oh yeah, so here, so it's interesting to look at the difference between um, the baseline model where we use only the material bias and the model where we include interactions. And for example, this property, nitrogen absorption at low pressure, really the material bias is doing a pretty good job of ranking the materials according to that property. Um, do I have an explanation? Um, I don't have a chemical explanation for that, really. It is interesting, though. And then, for example, H2S, the interactions are extremely important. Yeah, I don't have an explanation. Okay. Useful uh, knowledge, though. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Um, and then we do have one more question. Um, could these methods be used to rank materials on kinetic selectivity or diffusivity, for example, methane nitrogen diffusion into a small poured cough? Yeah, so what I like about this recommendation system setup is that in principle, you could have any property that you want here, right? So you can keep adding properties to this matrix. Um, so, so you could use different materials or you could have different properties like um, surface area or kinetic properties. Sure, as long as you have data for training the low rank model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And, and there is a paper um, from, I think it's from the Kim Jelfs group where they look at, they, they, they do a similar recommendation system setup for I think gas permeability in polymers. Yeah, so check out that paper where they do it with kinetic properties. Great, thank you. We have a response um, from Paul Ayakomi, which actually leads into the next question. So uh, Paul Ayakomi's response from Zoom is, thank you, that would be very interesting to see if it can be somehow related to structural data. And then actually a question that we have on Zoom from Amir Vadan Singh Patyal says, um, uh, which structural properties do you intend to incorporate in your studies and can DFT be real, excuse me, DFT be leveraged to identify them? Yeah, so you could, let's say this were experimental data, then including the binding energy according to DFT would be great because that could in principle enhance the predictivity of the experimental properties. 
for this simulated data, it's actually cheaper to just run the simulation than it is to conduct DFT. Um, but there's really two routes you want to go. One, include a vector representation of the materials as input to the recommendation system. And that vector will contain the surface area, pore size, density, fraction carbon of the materials. And the second route would be to combine graph neural networks with a re recommendation system. And there, the input would be the graph representing the material, where the vertices are the atoms and the edges are bonds. And then these message passing neural networks can learn vector representations from the graph. Um, so, so that's another research direction we're pursuing. Great. And this Thank will you. solve the cold start problem. Thank you. Uh, that question actually was from YouTube. And then um, just a uh, clarification related to that, we also had a question from YouTube from Yongchul Cheng, um, who asked if the bias matrix is related to the materials properties at this point. Sorry, if the, like, if the what? If the, your current bias matrix, I think you've answered in that question or in your answer, but is that bias matrix related to the material properties, i.e. pore volume and surface area? Oh yeah. So I think that would be a really interesting direction. We didn't look at that, the correlation of the material biases with different properties. And I think, yeah, I, I sort of wish we did because it does make sense to look at, for example, the correlation of that with surface area. So if it has a high surface area, then it just tends to absorb a lot of gases. So that's a good thing to look into. Very good idea. But we did not. Okay, great. I think that's all the questions we have um, on Zoom or on YouTube so far. Um, so if you wanted to continue on with your next uh, section, we can dive right into that. Okay, sure. So, and I will try to keep this high level and short. Um, so the second presentation I would like to give you is on Bayesian optimization as a method to efficiently search for performant nanoporous materials. So first of all, acknowledge the team. So the BO experts, Bayesian optimization experts are Ariane Deshwal and John Adapa at Washington State University in the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And you can read about this publication in Molecular Systems Design and Engineering, and it was funded by NSF. Okay, so here I'm just illustrating that COPs are very tunable again, very tunable materials, many possibilities. And we want to search for the optimal COP structure for different applications often. One such application is vehicular natural gas storage. So natural gas is thought of as a bridge fuel for vehicles, right? Going from hydrogen or going from fossil fuels, petroleum, um, going from gasoline to hydrogen, that would be the bridge. It has reduced emissions of pollutants if you draw a box around the car. There's an abundant supply of natural gas in the US, which this plot is showing. Uh, the downsides are there are fugitive emissions of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas itself. Um, and there's also groundwater contamination from fracking to consider. So that's why it's not the perfect fuel, it's a bridge fuel. The challenge with natural gas storage is, of course, it's low volumetric energy density. We want to densify it. So currently, the strategies are compressing it to high pressure at room temperature and cooling it down to a liquid. Uh, those have both infrastructure and um, storage tank disadvantages. And so we would like to investigate costs for adsorbed natural gas storage to densify the natural gas at a much lower pressure and room temperature. This will reduce infrastructure costs and allow for thinner wall, lighter and conformal tanks in the vehicle. And the cough performance metric that we use, how well does a cough perform for natural gas storage? Is it the liberal capacity? So here's the methane absorption isotherm in a cough. And the little capacity is the amount absorbed at the storage pressure, so P full, minus that that is retained at the discharge pressure, P empty. So basically you want the cough to absorb a lot of gas at the fuel station, but you also don't want the cough to hold on to the gas um, whenever there's an insufficient pressure differential to drive flow from your absorbed natural gas tank to the engine. 
So that's sort of to mot motivate the, the problem setup. Okay, so in Bayesian optimization, we think about the process of synthesizing material and measuring its property as evaluating a black box function f of x. So here's your material. And at this point, this is an abstract representation of the material. And then you input it into this function f of x and out comes a measurement of the absorption property. For example, the liberal plasticity. And this could represent experimentally or virtually synthesizing a material and measuring its properties, evaluating this function. And critically, evaluating this function is very expensive. It costs a lot of time and or resources. F of X here really represents the structure property relationship because there's the structure of the cough and out comes the property. So it's a relationship between structure and the property. Um, and it's a black box because we don't know much about it. We don't know, for example, the functional form of, of f of x. Our task in Bayesian optimization and just in practice is to efficiently optimize the structure property relationship f of x, i.e., we want to find the optimal material x star that maximizes f of x. So we're looking for a maximal absorption property, maximal deliver capacity, for example. And here, the optimization is done over a pool of candidate materials that we have in mind. And we wish to perform this optimization critically efficiently, i.e., we want to recover the optimal material while using the fewest function queries by synthesizing and measuring the properties of the fewest materials possible. So we don't want to do a brute force strategy where we synthesize all of the candidates and measure their properties experimentally or virtually. And Bayesian optimization will allow us to do that. Here's a high level overview of Bayesian optimization. You start by synthesizing and evaluating material. And then you have a new example. You have a structure property pair. With that example that you've collected, that data point, you should stop and reflect and update your beliefs about the structure property relationship. And I'll fill in the details of what that means. And using that updated knowledge, you want to judiciously select the next material for an experiment with the goal in mind of, oh, I want to find the optimum with the fewest experiments. So at that point, voila, you have picked the next material for an experiment and you close the feedback loop. And you keep iterating through this experiment, update knowledge, select next material feedback loop until one, your budget of resources has been exhausted or two, you found a material with a satisfactory property. So it's a very intimate experiment modeling feedback loop. And I'm going to show you um, to explain what, what the question marks here are, but that's a high level overview. And the goal is to find the material with the best property. First, we want to define a notion of material space. And one way to do this is to design a feature vector representation of material. For example, if this is our cough, we can represent it by a list of its structural features, void fraction, density, pore size, surface area, and chemical features. What fraction of the atoms are carbon, fluorine, et cetera. So we're abstracting coughs now is lying in a 12 dimensional space. So each cough is a point in a high dimensional space here. That's our material space. We'll also choose a kernel function. And you can think of a kernel function as taking in two materials, x and x prime, and outputting the similarity of those materials. So it's a notion of similarity between two inputs, two materials. So given two materials and material space, there are two feature vectors. This kernel will tell us how similar they are. And intuitively, uh, one very intuitive kernel is the square exponential kernel. And it looks at the distance of the materials in feature space. And it has this length scale hyperparameter that tells us how close in feature space materials have to be in order to be considered similar. Um, and so, yeah, if they're really close by, they're very similar, and they're very far apart, then they're considered dissimilar. Um, simple idea, but kind of a complicated mathematical idea for kernel functions. Okay, so remember, evaluating F is extremely expensive. So we're going to have a surrogate model, f hat, that 
is a probabilistic model, a statistical machine learning model that captures our beliefs about the true structure property relationship f of x. So if you look up surrogate in the dictionary, it means substitute. Here, this model is a substitute for doing the experiment. So here's our surrogate model. And it's a mathematical model, it's a probabilistic model. You input your feature vector and material. And one thing that it outputs is y hat, which is a prediction of the property of material represented by x. So the surrogate model serves as a cheap to evaluate approximation of the true structure property relationship f of x. More, the surrogate model is data driven. It takes into account all of our past observations, all of the past material property example pairs that we've seen. And let's say we've seen n of them. That's why I decorate this surrogate model with n here, because the surrogate model is going to improve as we get more data. It's going to change every time we collect a new data point to account for all of the data that we've seen. And there's one other critical feature of a surrogate model in Bayesian optimization. And that is that it must also output the uncertainty. So not only does it make a prediction of the property of every material in our pool, but it also tells us how uncertain we are about that prediction. And this helps us find blind spots in feature space. So to clarify a bit more, we're going to use Gaussian processes as a surrogate model. And here, we model the property of material X as a random variable. So we're putting on our Bayesian hats here and thinking of it as a random variable, in particular, a Gaussian distribution. And we're going to condition this random variable on all observations that we've seen thus far, because we want to take into account the data that we've seen. Okay, so the expectation of this posterior distribution is the expected value of the property material X. And then this variance reflects our uncertainty in that property. So again, we're taking the Bayesian perspective. It's a random variable. The variance is our uncertainty. Okay, and I'm just flashing up the equations here, but basically in Gaussian processes, the predicted property is a linear combination of the observed properties of the materials that you've seen. Um, and the whole idea behind GPs is that um, there's a really high covariance between properties of similar materials and a really low covariance between properties of dissimilar materials. So you'll see that these equations evolve looking at the similarity of the material with all the materials that you've seen. So the kernel is very important for building these functions here. Okay, um, another way to think about a GP surrogate model is that it gives you a posterior distribution over functions. So think of a function space and your structure property relationship lies in that function space. Um, then the surrogate model assigns a probability to each possible structure property relationship. Um, and if that was too mathematical, that's okay. Here's a simple visualization. So on the x-axis here, we have our one-dimensional feature space of the materials. And then the true structure property relationship would be this pink curve. So this gives the property for every material represented by X. Okay, and then the observations are the pluses. So here we have five observations. And then once we fit a GP surrogate model to those observations, the expected property of every material is given by the blue line. So that's a GP surrogate model conditioned upon the observations. And then the bands tell us the uncertainty. And you can see the uncertainty is very small if you're close to an observation that we've had, and it grows to be very big if you're really far away from the observations that we've had. Okay, so this is the GP surrogate model. It reflects our beliefs in the structure property relationship. So it serves as a surrogate for the experiment and also tells us about regions of feature space we are, we're really uncertain about because we haven't explored them. Okay, so with this surrogate model, hopefully you have a good idea of how we're going to keep track of our knowledge of the structure property relationship in light of our data and update it every time we get new data points.
now that we have a model for the experiment, a cheat to evaluate model, how do we judiciously select the next material for the experiment in order to efficiently optimize f of x to efficiently find the optimal material? Well, the idea is to balance exploration versus exploitation. And you probably experience this when you go to a new restaurant. So for example, I went to this Thai restaurant in Ben and I saw the green curry and I really like green curries. I tend to like green curries. So if I did full exploitation, I would exploit the knowledge of what dish I like to order green curry again. Um, and with the goal of choosing a dish that I'm going to enjoy the most, um, that might not be the best strategy. Instead, maybe I want to explore a new dish. So I could, in my mind, have a kernel that defines similarity of different dishes based on their ingredients. And this looks really dissimilar to everything that I've tried, so maybe I should explore that. But then there's a chance that I will order a dish that I don't like. Because I'm, I'm, I'm still don't expect to like this because I'm not a seafood fan, yeah. Okay, and so then by balancing exploitation exploration, you order something that's slightly different from what you've had before, um, but also that you think that you'll probably like. In the realm of material science, this is our surrogate model. And let's talk about exploration versus exploitation here. Exploration says we should pick a material next for the experiment that we are most uncertain about to improve our understanding of the structure property relationship. And in exploration, then we would choose this material X here because see how big the uncertainty is. Exploitation would be, we want to choose the material and chase after the material that we predict to have the highest property. And that would be choosing this material here because it is predicted to have the highest property. So that's pure exploitation, okay? And then the balance would be somewhere in between, which would probably be picking this point because, oh, it's predicted to have a high property, but there's also a pretty big uncertainty with it. So it balances the two, okay? And that's what the acquisition function does. It uses the surrogate model's predictions to score the utility of evaluating each material next while balancing exploration and exploitation. So the next material is chosen in an automated way without any human intervention by maximizing the acquisition function over all cough candidates minus the candidates you've already evaluated because you don't want to evaluate the same material twice. Okay, and so here, here's the illustration again. So I have my surrogate model in the top panel. In the bottom panel, I have the EI, oh, let's see if I can, this is covering up, but here's your feature space X in the bottom. Yeah, here's your feature space X in the bottom. The top panel is your surrogate model. And the bottom panel shows the acquisition function and expected improvement or EI acquisition function. And as I said, here's the material you'd evaluate next if you had a pure exploration strategy, the one with the highest uncertainty. Here's the material you'd evaluate next if you had a pure exploitation strategy, the one with the highest predicted property. This EI acquisition function is high um, in this region here where there's a lot of uncertainty. It's also high in this region here where you have materials that are predicted to exhibit high properties. So it balances the two. And if we maximize the, the EI acquisition function, we actually end up choosing this star here. So it's, it's pretty close to this material, but you move away from it. You move away from the pure exploitation material to get a material that you're more uncertain about. And you can see that this star actually happens to be closer to the true maximum. Um, so hopefully that illustrates the idea of exploration versus exploitation and how we design these acquisition functions to trade off these two competing objectives. Okay, so just to give you a very clear example of an actual acquisition function, this is the upper confidence bound acquisition function. And it's simply, um, you sum up the predicted property by the surrogate model and beta times the predicted uncertainty. So this is the exploitation term. Let's chase after materials that were predicted, that are predicted to have a high property. This is our exploration term. Let's chase after materials that have a high uncertainty associated with them. 
And then beta is a parameter that we tune to trade off the exploration and exploitation components. Um, and you can see why it's called an upper confidence bound. This acquisition function A of X is actually the top of this confidence bound on our structure property relationship. So there's a nice geometric interpretation of that. And it's high in regions of feature space that are predicted to contain high performing materials and or regions of feature space we have not visited. Okay, so finally, I want to redo the overview of Bayesian optimization now that you know about the two key ingredients, a surrogate model and an acquisition function. At iteration N of Bayesian optimization, you synthesize material N and measure its property. You get its absorption property. This is a very expensive experiment. And now you have a nice new training example, a structure property pair. Whatever our previous understanding of the structure property relationship was, we use this new training example to update it. So now we have an updated surrogate model that captures our understanding about the structure property relationship. And we use the surrogate model in the acquisition function to score the utility of evaluating each material next while balancing exploration and exploitation. And mathematically, we choose the next material as the one that maximizes the acquisition function. So voila, we have automatically determined the next material for an experiment. And you repeat this intimate experiment modeling feedback loop until you find the optimal material, find a material with satisfactory properties or run out of resources. Um, and I want to emphasize this can be applied in experimental or virtual domain. Okay. So I just want to quickly show you a demo of Bayesian optimization on simulated data again. Um, I would love to have a robot that can experimentally make costs and measure their properties, but yeah, so we just have simulated data here. But this is to illustrate the idea. So is this in this problem set, we have a database of 70,000 2D and 3D predicted cost structures. We're going to represent these cost structures with a list of structural and chemical features as a 12 dimensional feature vector. And the property that we wish to optimize is the methane deliver opacity simulated between 65 and 5.8 bar at room temperature. So we want to find the optimal cough inside this database of 70,000 without simulating absorption, without looking at the properties of all of them. And we use Bayes optimization to do so. We use the GP surrogate model with a matter and kernel. We z-score standardize the features and we use the expected improvement acquisition function. So this plot shows the performance of BO, of Bayesian optimization, in searching for the optimal material. On the x-axis, we have the number of evaluated costs. So this is how many experiments did we do? And it's iterative, right? So as you go on, um, we're keeping track of the maximum delivery capacity among the costs that we've acquired or experimented on. We initialize the model by selecting 10 random costs from the data set. We train the GP. So that's how we initialize it. And then this is all automatic. So in Bayesian optimization, it automatically chooses the next material um, and automatically updates our understanding of the structure property relationship. So this is taking the human out of the experiment feedback loop, experiment simulation feedback loop. And you'll see here, um, I've highlighted 100 here because this dashed line represents the deliverable capacity of the cough that is optimal. So this is the highest deliverable capacity in the whole database, right? And what we find is that with fewer than 100 experiments, Bayesian optimization is able to recover the optimal cough. And that's out of 70,000. So imagine a root force strategy where you simulate adsorption in all 70,000, or you measure adsorption in all 70,000 with an experiment. Here, we're only conducting fewer than 100 experiments and BO is able to recover the optimal cough. Uh, so that's quite remarkable. Um, and that has to do with the predictivity of methane adsorption using this feature vector, of course. And we also visualize the structure property relationship 
Here, these are the first two principal components of the 12 dimensional feature space. And I colored the principal components here. I colored each um, voxel of this 2D depiction of feature space by the average deliverable capacity of costs that fall in that voxel. So this is high deliverable capacity, this is low deliverable capacity. So you can see that the costs of the highest deliverable capacity reside in this region of feature space. So that's a way to visualize the structure property relationship. Um, and for this Bayesian optimization run that I just showed you, uh, down below, I'm showing the acquired set of costs. So on the very left, these are the initial costs that we randomly selected to initialize the GP surrogate model. And then this is showing how BO picks out costs from feature space to synthesize and evaluate virtually. And you can see here that BO concentrates its queries on this region of feature space that contains the high performing materials. Later on, though, it starts to explore the far regions, the far corners of feature space when exploit, no, exploration takes over. Um, so, yeah, I think this is neat to visualize the acquisition behavior of BO. And then remember, this is all automated decision making. Um, so it's a, it's a for loop. Okay. And I, I think this is my last slide, finally. Um, this is showing the maximum dollar capacity among acquired costs for Bayesian optimization in blue. Um, and you can see it tends to acquire the optimal cost after 150 evaluations. Um, and this shows the variance. And we're comparing it to a random search strategy in yellow. That would be the most naive way to try to find the optimal material. Just pick materials at random from the database until you find the optimal one. So this is the worst performing in terms of finding the optimal material to fewest iterations. But we also compare it to a state-of-the-art evolutionary algorithm, that's the pink curve, and to a supervised machine learning study using random forests with both a diverse training set and a random training set. And you can see that Bayesian optimization is able to recover the optimal cough with fewer experiments than the evolutionary algorithm and the machine learning strategy, the supervised machine learning strategy. Um, and for context, this is black bar here. Um, this is showing half of the distribution of the little passage of coughs. So this is the distribution of the, the properties here to give you a sense of where we are. Uh, but yeah, this is this is the top the little capacity. Okay, finally, this is my last slide. Conclusions here are Bayesian optimization can accelerate and reduce the cost of materials discovery. It's an intimate experiment model feedback loop. You conduct an experiment, update your knowledge, and automatically choose, automatically and judiciously choose the next material for an experiment. It's applicable in the lab or in a simulation. And for an example, we showed that the top of 70,000 coughs could be recovered in fewer than 100 simulations using Bayesian optimization. So it will save you resources. In our paper, in the Outlook section, we outline some extensions to Bayesian optimization of different problem settings, which you might be interested in. One is cost awareness. When you go to acquire a new cough, you might want to consider, oh, the ligands for that cough are really expensive. So what information will I get given the cost? So you consider the cost. Multi-objective BO is when you have not just one objective, but there are multiple properties you're interested in and they compete. For example, in separations, you want a material with a high selectivity and a high working capacity. Well, there are BO adaptations that find the Pareto front of your materials. Multi-fidelity BO, that's when you have a single objective, uh, but you have a high fidelity and a low fidelity method um, to predict the properties of that material. So for example, the high fidelity could be an experiment. That's the truth. And then the low fidelity would be a simulation. And so how do you, at each acquisition decision, you have to choose both a material to evaluate and two, a fidelity at which to evaluate that material. So do you do a simulation or do you actually do the experiment? And you walk between those. Batch BO is when you have parallel experimental resources and you acquire a batch of multiple costs at each acquisition instead of just one. 
Uh, and finally, robust BO is when you're looking for robust optimum. And that's important if you have uncertainties in your inputs. Uh, then you want to make sure that, oh, if your input changes a bit, um, your cough is still performant. Um, and, and yeah, that's it. I'll take any questions. And, and, and check out our paper. We, we have a, it's sort of a perspective. So we, we, we describe GPs and BO in a more mathematical way. Thank you, yeah. Professor and thank Simon. you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of questions from YouTube um, that came in for the last presentation. Um, so I'll answer, or I'll ask those first. Uh, the first question from YouTube is from Fergus McElwain, who said, were there any, any interesting observations when looking at the dimensionality of the latent space? The dimensionality, oh, um, yeah. So one thing is that as the matrix is more sparse, i.e. we have more missing values, the optimal dimension of the latent space is lower which makes sense because you have less information to determine the multiple elements of the latent vectors. Um, and yeah, and, and it, it also, um, so we also re-gather training data by selecting random entries to be observed versus not. And the optimal latent space the optimal size of it actually fluctuated quite a bit. So there is a lot of variance, um, despite the predictivity not fluctuating much. So I think that shows that the regularization term, there's a trade-off. You can have a high regularization term and a high dimensional latent space, or you can have a low regularization term and a low dimensional latent space. There's sort of a trade-off. And then the predictivity doesn't differ too much between those two scenarios. Um, so, so I think that's what I can say about that. Great, thank you. Um, the second question about the first talk from YouTube was from S. Gumma, uh, who says, hi, great presentation, Corey. Can you please let me know what was the size of your data set used for training and the supervised learning algorithm that you used? Oh, for, for uh, the recommendation system? Um, so the size of the data set, we have 560 costs and 16 properties. Uh, and so the number of data points would be 560 times 16 times the fraction of missing of observed entries. Um, so I don't know exactly what that data would be. And the name of this supervised machine learning model, and I don't know if it would be considered supervised really, sort of a weird combination between supervised and unsupervised, is a low rank matrix model. Um, and free, feel free to email me and I can send you some papers on this. Um, oh yeah, here. Um, so there's one paper written by, I think some folks at Yahoo in the context, oh, here they are, in the context of movie recommendations. So this is known as matrix factorization. And you should also check out Madeline Udell's paper, Generalized Low Rank Models. It explains it really beautifully. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have some questions from YouTube regarding the second talk. Uh, the first is from Shivam Parashar, who says, very nice presentation, Dr. Simon. Could you explain how the surrogate model calculates the uncertainty in the output results? Sure. Um, it took me a very long time to get a grasp of Gaussian processes. Um, and I think in our paper, we tried to explain the mathematical underpinnings of them. So how does the uncertainty work? Um, so here's the equation for it. So really you start with a prior distribution and the covariance of that prior is defined by your kernel. Um, and so this would be your prior distribution for what the variance is. Um, and then you reduce that by the similarity of a material with all the materials you've seen. So the essential idea is that once you have a new material, you can get an idea of its uncertainty of by looking at the similarity of this material with all the other ones that you've seen. And if it's really similar to a material that you've seen before, then you will be quite certain about its property. If it's very dissimilar, you'd be uncertain. So that's, that's how I would interpret this. So you can see this 
sigma n here, it looks at the similarity of the input with all of the materials that you've seen before. So that would be the intuition. So you rely on this kernel function to adequately describe similarity of pairs of materials and your feature vector. Great, thank you. And then the next question is from Fergus McElwain from YouTube, who says, thank you for the presentation. How sensitive were your results to the initial samples chosen? Oh, very good question. Yeah, we actually have a, yeah, so, so I have two things to say about that. One is that this BO plot, yeah, oh yeah, this, so this search efficiency curve here, see the bands, um, the stochasticity of this search efficiency curve comes from the random selection of the 10 initial points that we use to initialize a GP surrogate model. And what we did is we ran 100 different BO runs, all having different initial sets of 10 points. So this solid blue is showing the average, and this is showing the variance. So this shows that the performance is actually not too sensitive to the initial 10 points that you chose. And uh, the other thing I'll say is we also did a study where we look at how many initial points we choose to initialize BO when we changed it. So we did, I think, 1, 5, 10, 15, 20. And it turns out you can actually get away with initializing BO with fewer points and it finding the optimal material faster. So actually choosing 10 is not exactly optimal. You can choose five and still get to the optimal even faster than here. And that was a question the reviewer asked. So that's why we conducted that study, which is a good question. Yeah, so, so this shows the sensitivity or variance of the results emanating from the stochasticity of sampling those 10 initial points. Great, thank you. Uh, it does not look like we have any other questions on YouTube or Zoom. Um, so I, at this point, will hand over the presentation to uh, Nicholas Wilkins to take us out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Corey Simon, for your presentation on accelerating the search for performant absorbent materials using machine learning. We also thank all of our attendees for joining this webinar and hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of this webinar will be posted to the IAS's YouTube channel with an announcement on the IAS Twitter feed. The hope is that the work discussed today will be a useful resource for the absorption science community in the future. The IAS webinar series will pause for December and resume in 2022. We encourage graduate students and early career researchers to register for the second IAS Twitter poster conference. Um, we encourage everyone to attend, share a poster, and ask questions to their other participants. The registration deadline for the second IAS Twitter poster conference is the 29th of November. This is required to be considered for poster prizes. Announcements regarding the next webinar and other IAS online events will be posted on our Twitter feed and through the IES mailing list. With that, we thank you for joining us. We hope that you will join us again soon.